Hi everyone, my name is Cindy Hill, and I'm the nurse executive for Randall Children's Hospital. I've had the pleasure of being a part of our children's hospital for 35 years. Um, our children's hospital has been around for about 60 years, um, and we're very, very pleased to bring this presentation to you today. We've, um, we wanted, we've focused a lot, of course, over the course of the years on our medical care. We give excellent medical care to our children. But what we want to make sure that everybody understands is we're really now focused on a more holistic approach to the care that our kids need. We are our goal at, in the Children's Hospital and all of our pediatric practitioners is that we provide the healthiest environment for children as they grow so that when we turn them over to adulthood, they're as good as they can be. So with that, again, we're committed to the, the healthiest environment. We've got three s speakers here tonight to, that are gonna focus on that important topic of keeping our kids healthy through good, good food choices. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Heather Larson. She's one of our pediatricians with Randall Children's Hospital Pediatric Care at our Forest Heights Clinic. She works with children of all ages and especially enjoys helping her parents, pa patients and parents strive for a healthy lifestyle. Her background is that she graduated from Emory University School of Medicine and completed a residency and internship in pediatrics at New York University School of Medicine. Welcome, Heather. In addition, I'd like to introduce Tara Jones, who's one of our very, very special pediatric dietitians at our children's hospital. She has a degree in fine arts from Florida State University and spent 10 years working as a caterer and chef in both Florida and Oregon. Pretty impressive. Tara received a Master of Science degree in nutrition from Bastyr University in Seattle. I want you guys to know that I really worked hard on pronouncing that um, university's name accurately because it's spelled B-A-S-T-Y-R and so I just want to make sure that I didn't get it inaccurate. So. Um, her professional interests include whole food-based nutrition therapy, breastfeeding and lactation, and family feeding dynamics. So welcome, Tara. And to my left here is Chef Abby Femartino of Abby's Table. She has a passion for nutrition and health supportive qualities of food. The exciting thing about Abby being here is that she's going to make some food for us tonight. Among her specialties, she's able to easily craft inventive and delicious allergy-friendly cuisine that everybody loves. A world traveler, she brings inventive twists on local and seasonal ingredients to her recipes. She attended National Gourmet Institute of Food and Health in Manhattan in 2004. Welcome, Abby. So to begin the program, I'm gonna uh, kick it off to Heather Larson, Dr. Larson, and please help me in giving her a warm greeting. Thank you. All right, so food. We all love food. Food shouldn't, should be something that's fun and enjoyable for the family. It shouldn't be something that we struggle with within a family. Food is essential to the growth and development of everyone. From in children, we expect food to kind of provide the building blocks for their brain growth and for their body growth. And while in everybody, it is providing the supplies that our body uses in order to be able to repair it for the multiple damages that we do to our body and strains that we do to our body on a daily basis. As a physician, the emphasis on food is around us from everywhere. And as a physician, I, sit there and spend my entire day talking about trying to increase the quote unquote good foods in our body while decreasing the quote unquote bad foods in our body. We look to the USDA who has set out choosemyplate.gov where basically it sets out a general ideal and guideline where 50% of our diet should be among the fruits and vegetables, 25% should be lean proteins, and 25% of our diet on average should be a, the whole grains. This is the ideal, it's what we strive for, but it is not reality. When you have a family full of children, full of parents, some of them can be picky eaters, whether it's the children or the adults, it's what we aim for, but it's not reality. 
When a family decides to grow um, by having children, the discussion of food and the emphasis on food starts before your baby's even born. With your OB talking about your choice of whether you're going to feed formula or feed um, breast milk. And the education of the advantages and disadvantages regarding those start before your child even comes. And then your, ba your bundle of joy arrives. Your pediatrician walks into the hospital room and hopefully the first words out of their mouth is congratulations. But I can bet you from the second set of words that come out, comes out of their mouth focuses on food. So how's your baby latching? How are they feeding? And every subsequent visit after that time with any provider that you see focuses on how they're feeding, what they're feeding, how long they're feeding, or how much they're feeding, depending on which choice you do, whether it's breast or bottle or combination, and how often they're feeding. Most babies between the ages, between the day that they're born and when they're less than six months will feed somewhere between eight to 10 times a day, and that's normal. Then your child starts to grow up, and suddenly we're six months, we're starting to feed, we're starting to introduce solids. They're starting to sleep through the night. We're slowly trying to transition them from those eight to 10 meals that they've been eating consistently from since the time that they were six months, I mean less than six months, to the toddler time of usually on average about six to seven meals a day. You're starting to, we, in the first six months of your life, you've looked to your pediat pediatrician to help guide you as far as how much to feed them. And on average, we could sit here and say, most two months old feed about two ounces, four months old feed about roughly four ounces each feed. Once they hit six months and we start introducing solids, that's all gone out the window. We can't provide that information because everyone is different. Introducing solids, it's an art, it's not a science. We sit here and we try to guide you, but the truth is, in the past, traditionally, we've sat here and said, you know, why don't you start with the vegetables, then move on, move on to the fruits, and finally start, end with the pro lean proteins. However, it's a tradition. It's not based on science. Now, when I sit down with parents and talk to them about feeding and introducing solids, I basically say, start with the foods that you're familiar with, the ones that you eat, feed your family on a regular basis and eat within your family on a regular basis so they get used to those foods and those textures. Have fun with introducing solids. There is no wrong way and no right way to do it. Move fo forward with introducing solids as fast or as slow as your child tolerates it. Everything related to science is out the window when that comes. Typically, between the age of six, six months and 15 months, you still continue to have some control over what your child eats. They will eat when you choose to feed them. They will eat what you choose to feed them for the most part, regardless of what kind of solid. Yeah, occasionally they'll sit here and decline to eat the peas or something to that effect. But for the most part, your child will sit there and eat almost every food that you put into their mouth. They're starting to transition from that those eight to 10 meals a day down to the six or seven, but it's a gradual transition. There's no definitive that we can sit here and say, this is the right way to do it. By the time that they're about 15 months, toddlerhood starts to happen. We start to see the toddler eating habits, and these are very frustrating and very difficult for most parents. They decide self-will starts to come into the play. They start to be independent. Their motor development, their fine motor development is improving where usually between 15 and 16, 18 months, they're sitting here, they're able to put their hand into the bowl, pick up the food and actually put it in their mouth. They're also starting to play with utensils. They're making a mess everywhere. And those things are normal. Also, toddlers will typically play with their food. They put their hands in it, they splash it around, they smell it. They put it in their mouth, they taste it, they spit it out. These are all normal toddler behaviors that you typically will see. Then, in addition to that, as many of you who may have had toddlers at some point will know, they will have days where they eat nothing. And then the next day, or the next day, they're a boa constrictor or a garbage truck where basically everything you put in front of their plate or in front of them, they will sit there and eat continuously. This is normal. It's okay if they sit there and skip some meals. 
because they are managing and regulating when they are hungry. Some toddlers also will typically kind of pick at the foods. They'll sit there and kind of take maybe a bite or two and then maybe they're done. That's okay. That's also developmentally normal for them. Toddlers are very frustrating. We love them, they're cute, their smiles are there, but they are frustrating. And the most important thing to realize is just as you're before six month old, you're six month to 15 month old, we, they sit there and control exactly how much they eat. We can try to push them, but for the most part, we control when they're eating, what they're choosing to, or what their options are, but they just get to determine exactly the quantities that they're choosing to eat. Doesn't matter how much you push a less than six month old, they're only gonna eat what they want. Same thing with that six month to 15 month old. If in all honesty, they don't wanna eat it, they're gonna, you know their mouth is gonna lock shut and it is not opening, no matter how many tricks you try. The same thing happens with your toddler. They are continuing to recognize the cues of their bodies in order to control if they're hungry and when they wanna eat and if they wanna eat. And that is normal. Then your child continues to grow up. Now they're preschool age. Preschool age kids are starting to recognize the outside environment. They're starting to recognize um, the social cues around them. While modeling, watching parents is important from the day that we start solid foods, it is especially important from the parents at the age of preschool age because your preschooler is not listening to what they say, what you say. Doesn't matter how much you try, they're not listening to what you say, but they are watching what you do and what you're, what you're trying to do as far as eating goes. So modeling from a parent is very important if you want to establish good eating habits for your child. And yes, that means some picky eaters who are parents sometimes have to sit there and put those green beans in their mouth and smile, even if you want to spit it out and throw it in the garbage. That is true. It, at this age, we're starting to transition in the preschool age. You're going from those six or seven meals a day down towards the three meals that we typically think of and two or so snacks. And that just kind of is something like a gradual progression. While they're starting to pick up on social cues, you also may notice that your child loves, suddenly wants to help you with everything. This is when you can start getting them excited about food. They can start helping you with food preparation. Developmentally, if they wanna be there when you're cooking, they can take that cup of nuts and dump it into the big bowl that may be in the um, salad that you're making. Or they can go to the grocery store with you and if they're interested in, in different fruits, maybe they can pick out some of the produce and put it in your cart and stuff. Yeah, if you need to, you swap it out. But you let them start to participate to the level that they're interested in doing. This helps get them excited about different foods. It also helps them be more willing to actually try different foods that you may be willing to, that you're trying to prepare at the home and feed them. And they're also, as you're kind of cooking, having them sit there with you on the counter, taste the foods in the different ways, taste them as you're kind of going along so that they see that it does taste different depending on how it's prepared. Your child continues to grow up. Now, suddenly they're school age. Hopefully at this point you've established the eating habits that you want them to pursue and continue to perform as they grow up. Because now that we're school age, we're eating at least one meal, meal away at school. You may pack their lunch, but there's nothing that controls whether they are trading at the lunch table, eating half their lunch, eating none of their lunch, or eating all of their lunch. Or maybe they get the school lunch, in which case you have no control over whether they're eating what they're choosing to eat even at lunch. So with this, we kind of have to sit back and kind of realize that we've taught our children to this point. Hopefully those teachings that we've established from the time that they were born to the time when they go to school stick. In addition to that, School-age kids are becoming very aware of the social stigma and the social awareness around at school. So in many times, 
you will find that kids who may have grown up in families with eth ethnic backgrounds or vegetarian families will suddenly decide, you know, I don't want to eat what mom packed. I'm not going to eat it. And so they stop eating foods that you have routinely and always fed them at home. That's OK. This is normal. Honestly, I always encourage parents to kind of sit there and kind of push through, continue to serve the foods that you've always served them, that they've always eaten. It's a phase. It will pass. Just kind of continue to support them through it. Enough about the development, about the eating habits. Let's talk about a couple of the psychological aspects that are important regarding feeding and the development of feeding and eating habits within a family. First, I want to talk about the fact that you need to recognize your child from the day that they are born or soon after is pretty much eating what they need to eat in order for their growth and development. So from a parent's perspective, it's letting go. It's letting them feed and eat the quantity that they want. We've done studies where that show when parents feed their child filling foods, don't sit there and say, oh, you need to finish the plate, but we let them self-regulate how much they need. They are eating the amount that they need to grow, and it decreases the risk of obesity within a family. In addition to that, we've also done studies on the reverse side, where we kind of look at kids where we use food as a reward or punishment type system, where we're really trying to, they get rewarded for finishing their plate, or maybe they get punished for not finishing what was on their plate or not trying something. By doing this, we're teaching our kids to override their innate ability to self-regulate and eat what they need to do. And by doing this, we are creating a habit where we are gonna increase in our child the risk of develop, going on to develop obesity. And that is not what any parent would ideally want to see for their child if it's something that we can prevent. Secondly is the concept of, um, the concept where we typically think of foods in, good, in the sense of good versus bad. So in the reverse psychology world, we naturally go to what's bad for us. When we sit here and think of bad foods, that increase, studies show it increases our cravings for certain foods. We really want these foods. We crave the high sugar, the high fat foods, and these are the quote unquote bad foods, but we want them because we're not supposed to have them versus the good foods. We sit here, we push the vegetables, we push it, we push it, we push the good proteins, the chicken and everything, and you kind of push back against it. So by changing our entire thought process to re and recognizing that all foods have some value in some sort of way or fashion, changing our thought process to maybe our everyday foods and our sometimes foods and having those around the house and when the sometimes foods are around the house, not making a big deal of them, not using food as reward system or a treat um, and that type of thing kind of will help make it so that maybe our high fat foods and our high um, sugar foods are not necessarily, they're not bad foods. They're foods that we can have sometimes, but maybe we don't need them every, every day. And when we do have them, we have a little bit, but we don't associate it with that good versus bad, which is gonna make us sit here and crave it and overdo it. So in summary, as a pediatrician, if you leave here with one thing to remember, it's remembering your children will, record, will eat when they are hungry. They regulate what they need. So letting go. If your child skips a meal, it is OK. You are not starving them. They will eat when they need to eat. And now, to expand on this, or other concepts, is Tara Jones, our dietitian. All right. So the topic that I am going to discuss is going to build on what Dr. Larson was talking about, which is really what the role is of the parent and the child when we're talking about feeding. And it's one of my favorite topics to talk about. I talk about it with my patients admitted to the hospital. I talk to them about it when they're outpatient. I talk about it with everyone who will listen, really, <laughs> because I think it has such universal application. It's a, something that applies to healthy kids, to ill kids. It applies to kids who are overweight or underweight. It applies to everybody. And really, it applies to adults as well. So my goal for this will be to give you some 
information and some ideas about little changes you can do within your family that might decrease the stress at mealtime, decrease any sort of conflict going on, um, and decrease any power struggles that are happening. So the overall program is called the Division of Responsibility, and it was created by a woman named Ellen Satter, who was a dietitian in Wisconsin. And she coined this term over 30 years ago and has implemented it for years and years, and I find it to be really effective. So what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of an oversight or an overview of the program, and then we can talk a little bit more in detail. So she divides it pretty simply between parents and children. And the parents have three responsibilities. They are responsible for what food is offered, when food is offered, and where food is offered. And the children are responsible for how much to eat and whether or not to eat. And it's pretty simple. Sort of. So when we're talking about the parent's responsibility, what parents are responsible for what is offered. So this really does mean you, as the adult, choose what foods you bring into the house, what foods are offered on the table, what you feel is an acceptable food to offer. And Ellen would say that all foods are fairly equal, that she would like you to put out a selection of foods on the table that the child, the, the child will serve themselves in a family-style setting. It's going to include a variety of foods. There'll be protein foods, there'll be carbohydrate foods, there will be fruits, vegetables, whatever you choose to serve. But it's all out there on the table, and it's up to you. And you know, she's not making a huge distinction. She certainly doesn't go into this whole, you know, healthy food versus unhealthy food. But for the most part, she is encouraging families to choose more whole foods, more real foods, and, and really, quite frankly, the foods that you eat as a family, you know, that are specific to your culture, that your family likes to eat. Because the goal is to have the children eating what you're cooking. So that's the first rule for the parents. Second is the when foods are served. And this one is a big one for me. <laughs> I love talking to parents about schedules. And I think that the routine, you know, we know that toddlers and young children thrive on routine. They thrive on schedules. They need to know what to expect in order for them to give us the behavior that we're seeking, whether it's, you know, bath time routine or bedtime routine, sleeping, napping, all the things we spend a lot of time worrying about with our little ones. But eating is just the same. And for me, I talk to families about where their children are developmentally, what age they are, how often they should be eating. And if we're talking about a young child who's two or three, they're going to eat typically three meals and two to three snacks during the day at regular intervals. You know, these kids are little. They can't go for much longer than two and a half to three hours at the most without having something in their bellies. So. Coming up with a routine that works for your family, a schedule that's consistent, is going to let the child know what to expect. They're going to know that they are going to have breakfast and that snack is coming at a certain time, lunch, snack again, dinner, and have that routine built into them. And it's going to be a good ace in your pocket as a parent who's trying to implement the system to know that you, you're never going to have to go very, very long when your child refuses a meal. You can give them reassurance and reassure yourself that you're not starving them to death, you know, they're not going to die in the next two hours, and that they're going to have an opportunity to eat again in a couple of hours when it's time. And I'm sure a lot, I don't know, if those of you who are out and about with co in coffee shops and you see, or parks, I see it all the time, kids running around, they've got, you know, food in their hands on the playground, and it just... I think in our culture, we've gotten away from having established meal and snack times, and it's just become a free-for-all. People are just eating anywhere, everywhere. You know, Parents are afraid to leave the house without any food on them. So I try to encourage them to have confidence that they can, they can last for a couple of hours without a snack in their pocket. Thirdly is <laughs> where food is offered. And that is really going to be coming back to this idea of sitting down, of enjoying meals, of having meals together. Um, you know, us as adults, we may not need to eat every two and a half or three hours, but when you're having, taking care of a small child and they do need to eat at that time, the more that you are sitting down with them, even if you're just having, you know, something to drink or a couple of apple slices, you know, something light maybe, but you're sitting with them, you're engaging over mealtime, you're creating a sense of family, a sense of community, a sense of, um, a, 
you know, social norm about eating. And this gives you a great time to also be engaged and to talk about the food and enjoy it and taste it and ask the children, you know, what are you tasting here? What is, what is the spice? Have you ever tasted something like this? Does it feel crunchy? And you can get them really engaged in thinking about the food and connecting with it. And maybe it's a food they don't want or don't like, and they can say, I don't like the taste. It's sour or, you know, it doesn't feel, it's too gooey. But again, you're just having them connect to the food and you're making mealtime pleasant. All right, so the children are responsible for how much food to eat. And again, just, you know, I completely agree with Dr. Larson. It's, it's up to the child how much you eat. There are days where they want to eat nothing. They can, you don't even know how they're carrying on with the craziness because they haven't eaten a thing. And then other days when they're just, you can't stop them. They just want more and more and more. And that's a normal part of development. You can't force them to eat more. You can, but it'll backfire on you. But really, it's up to them how much they eat. It's up to the child. There's no negotiating. There's no uh, bribing. There's no rewarding. There's no, if you eat this, then you can have this. There's no, you have to at least have three more bites of this, X, Y, or Z. It's up to them how much have they eat. You've already decided that the foods that are being served are, are okay for them to eat, that they're appropriate, and that they're healthful. And so now it's up to them to decide how much they're going to eat. And then it's up to them to decide whether or not to eat at all. Maybe they want to eat all the bread and butter and nothing else, and it's okay. It's okay. Even if they do that for three meals in a row, it's okay. Even if they do that for three days in a row, it's okay. Nothing is going to come of it. Eventually, they'll tire of it. You're going to just keep everything light. You're not going to make any comments about it. You just go on. You're enjoying the food, the other foods. Everyone else at the table is enjoying it. And it's a pleasant experience. And there's no short order cooking. So there's no, uh, I don't like this food. I want a bowl of cereal. Or, you know, I, I, I'm not going to eat this. I hate this meal. <laughs> and OK, I'll make you, what do you want to eat? Right? You've, you've put options out there on the table. The one trick I would say is always having at least one surefire winner, one thing on the table that you know that they like, even if it is bread and butter, even if it's slices of fruit or you know cucumber with salad dressing dips, whatever it is, something that you know that they eat, just so that they're involved, so that there's not, they're not just staring out at a sea of chicken curry and you know spicy yogurt sauce. <laughs> and feeling like I don't, none of this feels comfortable to me. There's at least one thing on there that they're comfortable with so that they're part of the meal. And that's really, I mean, that's the, the gist of it. I think, you know, the, the goal is to, again, create any sense of power struggle. Create, kids are very smart, you know, and they know, I would say, especially our kids who are struggling at all, um, I see a lot of kids in the hospital who are considered underweight, you know, or they get this diagnosis of failure to thrive. And it's really devastating, and a lot of parents are worried about that. Or their kids are picky eaters. You know, oh, my child's picky. He only eats white things, or he'll, you know, he'll only eat crackers and peanut butter and jelly and banana, you know, whatever it is. But this works with them. And I would say that it takes commitment from the family. I think it takes a commitment, a willingness to implement these strategies, to let go of any, <laughs> any hesitation, you know, any concerns you have about the child wasting away for a couple of days, because we know that they don't. We know that kids eat based on their hunger. We know that they have it within them to eat and grow to the way that they're meant to eat and grow. But it takes modeling, it takes persistence, and one of the biggest things that this system does is just decrease any of that stress. It decreases the power struggle. It makes everything pleasant, and it lets it, it lets you be in. It lets each person actually be in charge of what what is appropriate for them to be in charge of. Right? It's not appropriate for a five year old to dictate what the family has for dinner all the time just because they only want mac and cheese. But it is appropriate for them to be able to say, I want these foods, or I don't want those, or I'm done, and move on. And, and to not be punished, to, and to not be bribed. Almost <laughs> sort of a 
trickiest of all is Ellen would say, Ellen Satter would say that if you're having dessert, that, that you just put it out there on the table with everything else. And that is a hard pill for people to swallow. People are not really uncomfortable with that one. What do you do? There's a plate of brownies on the table. <laughs> and you know, what are the children going to do? They're probably going to eat brownies. <laughs> right. But again, you've put it out. You've made the decision that brownies are OK to have at the house, and that brownies are going to be something that you're going to enjoy as part of this meal. I would probably not put out you know, the entire tray of brownies, but I'd maybe put out a few, one for each person in the family so that the, and, and I would let, just let them. And I, I do do this. I have a five-year-old at home, and I do do this. If we bake cookies, I know he's going to want cookies, so I'll just put a few on the table so that each person can have one. And it may be the first thing he eats. And I don't say, Mom, I'm just, OK. Was, how did you like that cookie? Was it good? And then he goes on. And you've, now you've, you've not made a big deal about it. You haven't elevated the cookie to you know, being better or worse than the broccoli that it's sitting next to, it's all the same. And he can choose. So that's overall the gist of the division of responsibility. I'm, I would say the, the hardest part is for families who have been sort of in this ongoing power struggle for a long time and who just feel maybe a little uncomfortable or you know, they, they know they've been going to the doctor because their child is underweight or overweight. And, you know, I get a lot of that on the flip side, too, not just the underweight picky eaters, but then the parents who've been told that their child eats too much and that they need to restrict their portions or give all low-fat foods. And really, this system is much more effective than trying to control and, and you know, make their child eat foods that none of us want to eat. You know, and this is effective for the whole family. So I hope that I hope that it helps somebody in this room tonight. I just wanted to start with cooking in general. So it resonated with me. Um, Heather was talking about um, toddlers playing with their food and um, you know sticking their hands in there and just kind of investigating. And cooking is really an investigative. It's very sen uh, sensory and it's a tactile experience for adults and kids alike. And I really like to. Part of my mission as a as a chef is really to get people excited about cooking from scratch, and that means cooking with whole foods, and you really um, can do that from from many ages. So um, when you have kids, or you maybe you don't have kids, but your siblings do, or you're a grandparent, it's really important. You can really get kids involved at a very young age in the cooking process, even if it's just demonstrating, holding them on your hip showing them what's going on in the bowl, helping them whisk something, you're making pancakes, getting them excited about the process of cooking. This can also actually help with um, the timing. If you're putting, trying to get to a routine of meals and snacks, um, kids will start to understand that there's a timing, there's a cooking process leading up to a meal. And that can actually be um, a relaxing thing, both for parents and children, if they know, again, you're trying to get out of being a short order cook. So you're involving your kid and saying, like, okay, this is, these are the things that are happening. And in, in a little bit, we're going to finish this dish, and then we're going to sit down and eat. So you're cueing it a little bit. Um, also, in just in general, if you're looking at it, cooking is a set of cultural tools. And we really learned this before there were cooking shows, before there were tons of cooking magazines and recipe books. We we're learning this from our family or from our friends. You're passing this down. So from what I see, it's really important to spend time in the kitchen um, on your own and with your family. It's a way that you're passing on these tools and these skills to the next generation. So we want to make sure in 25 years that people know how to cook still and make and saute onions and chop onions or whatever it is. So um, involve your kids in the preparation, right? So there's age-specific techniques. You can be demonstrating if um, they're younger than toddler age. Um, grab a stool up and let them dump things into the bowl, see what's happening. Um, when they're a little older, they can help you destem greens, pick herbs, all the tedious things you may not want to do every day, but the things that they will be so excited about. And it's, it's fun. I mean, it's just sort of like playing in the sandbox and you're um, having an ability to work with a lot of different things and you're picking up um, both you and your child are picking up um, texture, and maybe you're paying attention to things that are in season. Um, and you're, you have this forum when you're cooking to be able to share that with um, your child and with your family. 
when you get more comfortable with those basic um, skills and, and tools for your toolbox to make meals from scratch, cooking can also be really relaxing and focusing for the parents and for the adults. So of course, you have to focus so you don't want to cut yourself, right? But also, you, it's a time you have to slow down. We multitask a lot throughout the day. And when you're cooking, it's, an, it's a time that you can really connect with your family and connect with your food. So time and money. But here's the barrier. Who has time anymore to cook from scratch? And also, there's a barrier for some people that you know maybe they don't have money to be cooking a fresh meal every night for dinner. So there's ways to kind of get around this. Um, you don't have to cook a brand new meal every night for dinner. There's ways to do this. So if you're allowing your ch child to select what they want to eat, let's say you've made a meal and you are offering three or four different things as part of that, and they only eat one thing, and you have a lot of extra vegetables, maybe the next morning um, you can use those vegetables and scramble eggs with them. And now you have another way that you're u utilizing um, what you already have in your kitchen. Similarly, extra vegetables, extra protein. If you chop it, you can make soup. And soup is a whole new meal. It's a way to really stretch um, your ingredients. Um, likewise, um, if you look in your fridge and you've had the best intentions of buying a bunch of greens when you went to the farmer's market and they're starting to look a little sad, feel free to make smoothies. Oftentimes, kids love smoothies, and you can hide a lot of greens in there. You don't even have to hide them. You can show them. Like, I'm putting all these greens in there, and it's awesome. It's also strawberry season, so we're going to put strawberries in there. So you can, as an adult or a kid, really um, boost your nutrition and kind of extend the produce and the, the fresh ingredients that you're making. Also, if you start moving away from... Um, packaged foods and processed foods, your food dollar, I mean, you, it's just, a, it's just a, a choice and it's a change in how you're shopping. It's also how you're spending your time. Um, it may take a little more time initially, but you can um, find that you will be able to utilize more. So if you're cooking out of a box, there's a limited amount of food you can make to that, right? And if you have fresh ingredients, even if there's extra, you can extend them and put them into something else. Um, I did want to say, too, in terms of getting kids involved, just moving back, um, getting kids involved in the cooking process not only kind of starts to get them familiar with the rhythm of cooking and then eating a meal and sharing that meal together, but it can also help mitigate picky eating. So there's some pride and a sense of accomplishment that um, kids can have, just like a, a, an adult can experience. If you love lasagna and this is the first time you're making homemade lasagna, you're going to feel pretty excited about that, to share that with your family or friends. And kids can feel the same way. I um, teach some kids cooking classes, and I have a um, story that I'll never forget. And we were, we had, there were a couple um, parents coming in, and they like to tell me, well, the, my kid is a fairly picky eater, and I don't know how they're going to do with some of these things. We're cooking a lot of vegetables. And I said, no problem. We'll just see. And um, so we're making a um, frittata that has spinach and a little bacon in it. And to this kid who was a picky eater, he went into it thinking, we are making bacon breakfast pizza, and I'm going to make this pizza for breakfast. I have no idea why he thought it was pizza. It was round. We're making it in a pan, right? It goes in the oven. But he was so excited, and he really ate that. It had a lot of spinach in it. His mother was so impressed. So I think you, um, it's important not to underestimate what um, the power of cooking can do for kind of um, in increasing the enjoyment of food overall for yourself and also for our kids. Um, one thing I want, I'm going to show here, and again, just the last port, part of this time and money-saving technique, this is if you walk away with one little technique, this is one that you, you can have. Um, if you're chopping and you have vegetable ends like carrots and onions and garlic, um, peels, celery ends, the parts that you're not going to use, keep them in a bag. I keep like a produce bag around when I'm um, cooking, and I'll fill that bag with those things. Things you don't put in there would maybe be cabbage and then things with seeds like tomatoes and cucumbers. Put that bag, I, actually, sorry, I use a Ziploc bag. Keep it in your freezer. Keep filling it. And then when that bag is full, you can make stock. And just bring, um, dump the ingredients in a pot, cover it with water, bring it to a simmer, and let it simmer for about an hour, hour and a half. If you have chicken bones or something like that, you can throw in there too. And then you strain it, and then you have that liquid to make your soup to extend it, or you can use that um, liquid to make rice or beans and things like that. So most people think they don't aren't able to use those little vegetable ends, but you really can. 
So um, one technique for you. This is like when you're an adult, you get to kind of channel your inner child when you're cooking. It is Cooking is sometimes messy. Cooking is um, very colorful. Cooking, you're interacting with a lot of textures and flavors. And this is really fun. I think if you're really going to be trying to sustain a, a life a lifetime of cooking from scratch and enjoying a healthy lifestyle. Part of that is going to be um, becoming familiar with the techniques that you need and the ingredients. Um, and, but also, um, practice makes perfect. Not all meals have to be perfect, though, right? So you can make, it's very actually, it's hard to make something that's not edible, just straight up. Like, it's, it's actually hard. You're going to see if something's burning, you're going to pull it off the, the stove, right? So just you know, relax into it and, and experiment. And, and you can, you're setting a good example for your kids too, to know that you can make something delicious. And maybe the next time you make it, it'll even be more delicious because you've learned from that. But it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to practice it. You just have to kind of get in there and do it more. So um, you are laughter in the kitchen. I think I like to say that laughter is a good seasoning into what you're making. Like if you feel happy and comfortable, then maybe the food's going to just taste better. If you're really stressing out and following the recipe and you forgot an ingredient, you know, just try to substitute something, make it a little more easy and enjoyable for yourself as well as for your family. Um, the last thing I would like to think about is in terms of a healthy lifestyle, and this in in incorporates kind of having fun with it. Um, there's a, there's the food experience is really an important concept that I think about, and it's a, it's not just what food you're eating, but it, like Tara was saying, it's how you're eating it and when you're eating it. So, creating like, meal time actually extends the, your food experience, and there's been um, a lot of kind of um, date, uh, data behind the longer people's food experience, the greater sense of satiation and enjoyment they feel from that food. So if you're really hurrying and you're eating in your car, you may have made, ate this most delicious kale salad that we're gonna be eating, but you didn't like really absorb that in the way of the overall experience. And if you're sitting down and having a, a meal even if it's not the most helpful ingredients on the table, if you're um, having some conversation and you're sharing that with your friends and family, um, it can extend this food experience. People tend to eat a little bit less, and um, there's just a greater sense of enjoyment from that. So consider the ways that, on a daily basis for yourself or for your family, that you can kind of create these food experiences um, with kids or without kids. Um, last slide before my demo here is kids eat what parents eat. So I get a lot of questions like, what are some kid-friendly recipes? Kid-friendly recipes, I mean, if you're actually having them prepare the food with you, there's kid-friendly recipes in terms of maybe some more simple techniques. But I um, would say that kid recipes are, are the same as adult recipes. Like your kids should really be eating what you're eating too. Um, again, it saves both time and money if you're making one meal. So if you're making a meal that includes all your kinds of eaters at the table, if it has to be allergy friendly, make that meal for yourself even if you don't have those food allergies. It just can, again, you'll save time and money. And it can just be more enjoyable. No one's sort of um, isolated, no one's singled out for having to be eating something different, uh, which I think is important. Make sure that the food you're making for your kids is tasty to you, too. <laughs> Sometimes I've um, kind of experienced this where people say, like, oh, my kid just really doesn't want to eat this or that. And, and maybe it's, you know, they just are not hungry and they don't, are not interested in eating that food at that time. But maybe it's because it's not seasoned as well as it could be. So you don't have to be afraid to really, um, I mean, you wouldn't have to go overboard on salt, but you shouldn't for yourself either, right? Um, Either way, it should be like nice and flavorful, and you can experiment with introducing spices and different ingredients to them. And, and ex, um, as Tara mentioned, kind of like having them um, experience that at the table and talk about that. So kids eat what parents eat. And um, now, without further ado, I'm going to be demoing a couple recipes that are kid and parent friendly recipes. So we're going to make a, um, a spiced kale salad that has some sesame oil, and we're going to be using three different spices as in addition to garlic and ginger. And I'm putting this together. A kale salad might be familiar in concept to a lot of people nowadays. Um, I'm kind of boosting it up and making it a little more exciting by adding some different spices in here. So we have, um, uh, this is garam masala, um, or you could use curry powder. Garam masala usually has um, the three C's of Indian spices, coriander, cardamom, and cumin in addition to um, a little bit of black pepper and some sweet spices too, like cinnamon. 
it's kind of lovely. And then um, we're going to put a, a, just a pinch of cayenne pepper. I brought um, ground cumin. I don't know why. Maybe I'll just throw it in there. I'm going to show you one technique for ginger. I've already chopped the ginger, but I just wanted to show you. This is the easiest way to peel ginger, just with a regular old spoon. This is a spoon from my home. And ginger is so knobby that sometimes when you cut around it, you lose a lot. So in terms of efficiency, it's actually really easy just to peel it this way. So that's all I'm going to do for now. But just consider using a spoon as your new tool for ginger. So here's where you can get um, your kids involved with the greens. So kale. This is um, curly green kale. There's a few different kinds of kale. And to de-stem kale, this is something that your toddlers can help you with, or your um, preschoolers. If you hold it with your non-dominant hand and then just pull down, that's the easiest way to de-stem kale. And you can keep these for your stock, or even some people put them in their smoothies if you want to. So I'm just going to do a few of these, and then we'll go ahead and cut them. You can make the same recipe with any kind of leafy green, really. Um, you could use mustard greens, collard greens. It's just the technique, really. So this is very satisfying, as it probably sounds. It's like nice and efficient. You're getting things done. Um, the nice thing about this kind of salad is that unlike lettuce-based salads, it actually, I'm just going to do one whole head. Um, unlike lettuce-based salads, it actually lasts well in your fridge. So you're taking the time to make this beautiful salad from scratch. This can last in your fridge for four to five days. So that's why I encourage you, the recipe will call for two heads. And that's because you can just eat a little bit or present it at a meal um, and see what happens. So I'm going to ultimately be using this bowl. So I'm going to move these aside here. And um, I'm just going to show you this little technique. If you kind of line up, so if you're losing, using lacinato kale, which is the um, kind of flatter, they also call it dinosaur kale, which is cool to talk about with kids because it's dinosaurs. Um, you, it's easier to kind of line them up and roll them. For the curly kale, you just kind of have to fudge it and roll it. Um, I like to tell people to hold the knife at the edge of the blade. It's like when you play baseball and you choke up on the bat, you have more control over your swing. It's just the same. So try that at home. You don't have to hold the knife down here. You can actually hold it at the edge of your blade. And you don't have to have as large of a blade as this. You can also use something smaller. So um, that helps me. And then with my non-dominant hand, I'm going to protect my, um, my fingers and actually hold the knife against my first knuckle there. And I'm going to creep my hands back. So I'm slicing just thinly here. If you're doing this in a very, very skinny little way, this is called a chiffonade. Uh, you can be fancy and have a French technique in your kitchen. So this is um, technically called a chiffonade. So it's bite size. I cross this way as well. And I use my big old knife to actually move the ingredients over to my bowl. I'm going to do this one more time just to show you. And then move on because we have a sweet recipe to prepare too. Again, I'm just going to, this is called my bear claw in my left hand. I'm talking about kid friendly things. You can say when they're old enough and they're maybe, um, you know, eight to ten, they can start working with knives more. And you can introduce the bear claw, which is the thing that actually protects your fingers. So this is pretty fun and exciting over here. Okay, so now we're going to just work with an apple. I'm going to just cut um, a little piece just to show you. And just so it's not terribly distracting with a lot of greens here. I'm going to just wipe this board off. Okay. And um, so like r anything that's round is a little un... Um, wheel, unwielding at the beginning. So you have to figure out how to make a flat surface. So the first cut on any round thing should be to make it like a flat surface like that. Um, you know, potatoes, anything, um, root vegetables. And now I'm going to use my little bear claw and cut this way to make little slices. This may be a familiar cut for all of you out there. We're just making little slices. And then again, you know, if you have a shredder, you can use a shredder. But if you're working with kids, you just watch toward the end. Make sure that they know they don't have to go too far down with a shredder. But a, sh a standing shredder is actually fairly kid friendly. I'm just going to make little kind of matchstick cuts here. So I'm cutting these. And now I have little uh, matchsticks. I'm going to cut across there so we have little kind of bayonet things. In we go. You can use the whole apple for this recipe. We're going to then do 
some garlic and ginger, which I've minced. Actually, this is more like finely chopped, if you're being really specific. And I'm going to add um, some lemon juice, just two tablespoons of lemon juice in this recipe. We're going to add one tablespoon of olive oil and one tablespoon of sesame oil. So a really standard um, vinaigrette recipe. I really honestly do one-to-one -one in terms of an acid and an oil. Um, so you don't have to use too much oil. What happens in this recipe is actually the um, lemon juice and the salt are going to agitate and kind of start to break down the cell wall and the kale. So it's going to soften and it's going to be a little tastier. So I'm going to use half a teaspoon of salt. I'm going to use some kind of like a nice heaping bit of the garam masala. And experiment with the different spices at home. We have these on our fridge. Um, I can get this off. These are magnetic. Pretty cool. So that's actually easy. And you can kind of start like some spice identification early on. What's the red one? Cayenne pepper. Spicy one. So um, for this, I am going to put gloves on. I don't at home, but just because I'm going to be getting my hands in something else. But here's like the hands-on tactile part of this. So both for adults and kids, this can be a fun um, thing to do at home. So um, I have, I cook with my nephew a lot, who's three, He's, and um, he loves making this recipe with me. So I'm actually going to just squeeze it. So hand curing kale salad, right? So you're actually almost like massaging, almost as if I'm squeezing water out of it. So you get, go ahead and squeeze this about 15 or 20 times. And as you can see, it's going to actually really shrink down quite a bit and softens. This makes it also more digestible when you add an acid or a salt to um, a, a kind of sturdy leafy green like this because it starts, starts breaking the cell wall down like I mentioned and um, it's also like lemon juice or apple cider vinegar are just generally healthy acids to include. Okay so I'm gonna let it sit and hang out. You can taste it which you will be tasting it momentarily actually. We're gonna pass around samples some that I already made. You can also do this, like let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes and then massage it again if you want to cure it down even further. This can go in your fridge and like I said, you, it can last for four to five days. So um, I hope you make that recipe. I'm gonna move on to one that is um, the sweet one. And you know, um, uh, like both Heather and Tara mentioned, as adults, we may not need to eat every two and a half hours. Um, but um, maybe kids do, or maybe you make this recipe for breakfast and you eat it with a smoothie and you have these little, um, what I call, raw oatmeal cookie dough bites. Doesn't that sound awesome? Yes, indeed. So this is really easy. Um, I'm just going to identify the ingredients for you guys first. This is just um, almonds, raw almonds and raw walnuts that I uh, ground into a meal in a food processor. If you don't have a food processor, maybe you have a blender. Try it in your blender. If not, you can put it in a Ziploc bag and then have fun with really pounding it. Pound the bag, and that's really fun for kids. And it's also stress relieving for adults, too. You really need to just pound it out. So it's a cup of each in here, a cup of the oats. If you have a food processor, I like to um, grind these in the food processor, too, because it makes them more granular. But in this case, we're just going to add them in. A cup. So these are pint jars. I love using the jars because then I can actually visually see how much I'm adding, and that really helps me. Um, it saves you from doing a bunch of dishes using measuring spoons. I'm going to add um, a pinch of salt. Actually, that was more like a chef's pinch, which is a quarter teaspoon. A pinch of salt is um, typically an eighth of a teaspoon. So if it calls for a quarter teaspoon of something, feel free to try to just use two pinches. Save you again on the dishes. I'm going to add some cinnamon here. I'm going to add like a healthy, nice dose of cinnamon. This is coconut oil. It was so warm before. It's supposed to be melted, which it generally is sort of melted here. Um, but you can melt it on the stove and then add this in too. This is my ginger spoon. I'm just going to add this in. Actually, I'll go ahead and stir this in first and then add in my wet ingredients, which are my coconut oil, raw honey, and my vanilla. And then at the very end here, we're going to add in some raisins. And again, I'm going to, just for this demo, put gloves on and kind of work this by hand. So this is another really fun one. Rolling, we're going to roll these balls. This is Rolling is a great thing for like two and three-year-olds. Um, at home, we roll meatballs together. Uh, we roll these guys. So um, there's lots of fun to do with the technique of rolling. 
we're going to add in two teaspoons of cinnamon. I'm sorry, of vanilla here. And, doo -doo -doo. and then lastly, I'm going to kind of be eyeballing my honey. We're going to add in half a cup. And then I keep this in my um, freezer. I keep these rolled in my freezer. Let's see. It seems about good because this is eight ounces. It's 12 ounces. Okay. And you can just pull them out once they're rolled. You can just pull the, you know, a few of them out and put them in your bag if you feel like you need emergency snack food or um, have them for breakfast or like we do also is kind of eat them as a dessert or put them on the table with your meal. Why not? So um, I'm going to mix this in and we'll add raisins. You can add chocolate chips if you want it to be really special and chocolatey. You can also do um, dried cranberries. If they're bigger, like dried cherries, you may want to pulse them in with your nuts. And um, this, I can even feel through this. This feels pretty fun. It can be a fun thing for kids to work with, especially um, if they're not comfortable. Like there's some kids that aren't that comfortable getting messy. <laughs> so this can be a fun one, just kind of like break through that barrier. It's okay, food is messy sometimes, but you always clean it up. So um, this is it here. So at this point, what I would do, I'm just gonna make a little room here. Um, if, if initially you make this and they're not really forming little balls easily, put them in your fridge for about 10 or 15 minutes and um, then try it again. And it can often be easier. So um, sometimes when we make this, um, my husband and I don't even, we're a little too lazy to even roll them into balls. So we'll just put it in a Ziploc bag like this and then just pull out like a bit of it. You don't have to, um, if that feels like you don't have the time at the moment to do it, and you can kind of pull out a hunk of it from the freezer and then roll them if you want to. So that is it. I think um, I'm gonna make just one more for demonstration, but we have these out and ready for sampling as well. Um, I know we're gonna open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions about these recipes, actually, that I've just made? I have um, yellow beets here, and I was gonna just throw that in just to show you. It's like really pretty. You can just throw in kind of different things. Um, and kind of experiment and have your kids try some things. You know, when you're playing with um, food, as I talked about before, color is really important. So if you're eating a whole meal, even if it's a really nutritious meal, if everything is green, you're going to just want something white. You're probably, or like if everything is creamy and you have um, soup and mashed parsnips and um, creme brulee or custard, you're going to want to eat like potato chips or something, right? So you could consider texture and color and also flavor balancing when you're putting together food. You have a question? I'm just wondering, I don't know how to pronounce it, but how, where do you get the, is it garam masala? Oh yeah, garam masala. Um, so luckily here in Portland, most of our grocery stores have um, items in the bulk section. So you can find them in spice sections, but sometimes that's um, a, a big investment financially to do that. And also you're really supposed to change ground spices every six months. So I consider, um, what I do is I go to New Seasons or even, I think Fred Meyer has spices in bulk um, and get little bags of them and then put them in my little jars and then keep them that way. So um, you should be able to find it really anywhere you'd find spices. And I, enc I encourage bulk buying because it's more affordable. OK, great. So the question was if there's um, can't use lemon juice um, in the kale salad, I would use apple cider vinegar is a great alternative. That would be number one. If you can't have apple cider vinegar, you could try really any vinegar that you can have. Champagne vinegar, um, a lighter vinegar would be nice. Rice vinegar, yeah. So the question is relating to dessert and sort of equalizing the playing ground between the other foods we would eat and dessert foods. And so your question is if the if you're not happy with what your child chose to eat or not eat, should dessert still be offered as part of that equation? Yeah. Well, I would say that if you're really following Ellen Satter's theory, you've already put dessert on the table, right? You've put it on there. You've made it part of the dinner. So my guess is chances are they've already eaten that part. <laughs> <laughs> and but again, it's up to you. I mean, it, perhaps, oh, let's say perhaps throughout the whole day, they really ate, just kind of picked. They weren't having a very hungry day and were just eating off and on or not eating, or not making the choices you would have liked them to make. It's still up to you to choose at dinner time if you're going to put dessert on the table.
Maybe that's the night you want to skip it. But maybe you maybe you earlier that day had had fun cooking in the kitchen and made these balls and your child is expecting it. And, you know, it was sort of you're going to celebrate what you just did together. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it and I wouldn't take that away or withhold it because of one day. You know, we we. We look over time. Children grow over time, and I just don't. I encourage parents not to get hung up on day-to-day -day choices that their kids make. How well they eat one day versus the next day. It, it generally e evens out. So the question is, if you have children who have special medical needs, whether it's a serious, a ser significant food allergy or something like diabetes. So of course we we need to be mindful of of providing foods. You know, Abby spoke to food allergies and really sort of making everything equal, not singling out everybody. Certainly in the case of, you know, celiac disease where you're allergic to the gluten protein, you, you really can't have that. Um, so whether or not your family has either decided to all be gluten-free or have certain meals that are gluten-free or in that case you may, you know, if you've got multiple kids and you're going to do pasta that night, you know, it may be that you do need to cook a separate gluten-free pasta for them. But I, I would say that as you learn more and more about those certain conditions, particularly with allergies, you get start getting creative and you start learning other recipes and really um, helping the rest of the family to learn to enjoy that types of food, type of food as well. Diabetes is a different thing when we're talking about kids. Usually they rely on insulin and so you, you have that balance. I mean, you certainly have to follow the medical needs of your child. But I think that there's a way. I mean, I do think that this can apply to them reasonably within a safe way. Okay, so the question is regarding public schools and the fact that they're on such a time crunch that kids often only have, say, 15 to 20 minutes to eat. And there's certainly plenty of kids who eat at different speeds and may not have adequate time to finish their meal. You know, I think that that is an issue. I, th I think my son falls into that category where he just doesn't have time to eat it. So I, get, I would say knowing that and having, you know, incorporating into your family's schedule the routine where he's probably going to need a snack when the child gets home. You know, that's going to be built into your snack time, making sure that they have enough to eat. You could also think about making sure that some of the foods that you're packing have higher, you know, either they're higher in calories to give, or higher in fiber, have some protein, and that are easy to eat. But that's, I mean, that's a tough situation, and it certainly, I think, just speaks volumes about how our culture is on this speed eating, you know, moving much away from enjoying food and sitting and, and taking time to feed yourself. It's, it's sort of obligatory rather than for enjoyment and nourishment. But it's tough, and I would say it really it comes down to a scheduling issue for your family. So the question is about a, a child who is almost three who is described as more typically grazing throughout the day, not really on a scheduled feeding plan, and most uh, is allowed to essentially have access to food whenever she likes, whenever she sort of feels it. Is that did I capture that? Not for the meal, but for, the snack. for snacks, so between meals. Okay, and and would I move away from that? So I, personally, my my personal philosophy that I share with families would be to move away from that. I think that what we end up seeing with kids who, who graze or who, who are really have access to free access to food between meals tend to eat less food when they're sitting down at meals. And the meals that we serve, you know, we think of breakfast, lunch, and dinner as our main meals. And I think parents pay the most attention to those meals and making sure that we're offering balanced foods and a variety of foods during those meals. And so you sort of get like your nutritional bang during those meals. And kids who do graze between meals tend to not eat as well during those main meals. And so overall, I do think, I, I do encourage families to move away from that grazing. And again, you know, it's personally, I, I feel that a, somebody who's three isn't able to make the choice of what foods should, you know, are offered and when to eat. I think we have to tell them that at that age. Oh, well, we, have, we only have certain foods in her area, so, yeah. Oh, that she has access to. Yeah, she only has yeah. certain foods that we have. It's not the, yeah, the yeah. potato chip drawer. 
<laughs> sure. And so, you know, that's that's how I approach it. But I think, too, we have to, you know, it, it really depends on how you feel she's eating at her other meals and how she's growing and, and how you feel that that works for your family. What about kids that, you know, you have a hard time waking up in the morning? A lot of times you're pushing them out the door to get on the bus and they don't have time for breakfast. As a pediatrician, as a pediatrician, I typically say at least hand them a banana and a granola bar to throw into their book bag until for them to eat at some point when they decide that they're hungry. Because most teenagers and school age kids, if you sit here and try to push them to wake up earlier, they're not going to eat regardless. So just hand it to it, throw, them, throw it in their book bag, and at some point when they suddenly decide that they're hungry, they have at least something that is somewhat filling for them to be able to eat at their own discretion. Smoothies are great for that, too, if you can pack something like that, because then they're kind of easier, and you can, I don't know about schools these days, if they're able to drink things, like, in class, but it's, it's an idea. So, my daughter's eight, and we went to the doctor last week, and um, I just wanted some tips. Um, we're trying to uh, not gain any more weight, but she doesn't necessarily need to lose weight, just not to gain any more weight, stay stable. Um, <clears throat> and they, the her pediatrician recommended... Um, non-fat dairy and for snacks just uh, vegetables so just carrot sticks zucchini sticks celery sticks stuff like that so for any three of you do you agree with that and is there anything you would add to that to just kind of maintain weight and not gain any more weight because i mean when you're saying to eat the bread and butter i mean i'm not going to keep bread and butter in my house but um you know just to kind of eat something constantly like that is that healthy like is that do you recommend that I mean, as a pediatrician, if you sit here and say you can't have this at all, as soon as they come in contact with it, they're going to overeat it. Right. So kind of occasionally um, try, trying to change it to, okay, you love potato chips. It's an occasional food. It's not a bad thing if you eat it. But rather than having it once a day, maybe we have it in the house once a week or once every two weeks um, and that type of thing. So not doing complete and total restriction. Restriction doesn't work. And, um, and everything. So kind of getting the whole family on board, kind of changing out everything in the fridge and kind of moving the whole family towards kind of a healthier lifestyle and everything and encouraging her to be active and stuff. It's about the balance. So I never sit here and say, oh, they can't have any chocolate chip cookies. It's more, hey, rather than maybe having it in the house all the time, maybe we bring it in the house every once a week or something. And it's one cookie rather than the pack of Oreos. Um, and the older they are, the more easy access they have to being able to go get the things and the less control you have over it. So in those instances, it's just about not having it in the house so that when it is there, it's okay for them to eat it. Um, so I would agree, too. I, you know, I, I think that there's a lot that we know about restriction and that whole idea of, of saying that something is bad or you can't have this food. Um, we know that kids will eat in secret. They'll have it, you know, or they'll save up their money and on their walk-in out and they'll go to the gas station and buy whatever they can and, and eat it. So I think just making it... So that it's not a, a, this food that they can never have and not putting special restrictions on the child, not making it the child's problem, but making it a change within the family. And knowing that kids, kids eat what parents eat. And, you know, and, and as the parent, it's up to you what foods you bring into the house and what foods you offer. I personally don't use that approach of just, you know, all veggies and fat-free milk. Uh, I don't think it's that effective, and I think that kids need, they need protein and they need fat, and that's part of what keeps them full. Um, so I, I, I try to work with families and work with kids and find out what, what do kids like to eat? You know, what do they like to eat? And how can we make that work for you? I think a lot of these strategies are effective because it's, it's forcing the family to eat together and to, to think overall about how we eat in this family. Um, yeah. So is that okay to have one I'm okay. I'm okay with it. I don't want to speak against your doctor. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I think that there's a lot of 
I, I think there's a lot of weight that goes into that people put on, you know, calories and whether, you know, it's, it's a very minute difference between non-fat milk and 1% milk. I don't think it's going to make or break anything. But I think I think for the most part, when we talk with kids um, about weight management, it tends to be a family issue and just really sort of changing everyone's outlook on this is not, you know, your problem. Right. We're just going to we're going to make changes. Right. Yeah. And there's balance. I would encourage you to talk to a registered dietitian. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a three-year-old, and he loves cooking and baking. I was wondering if you have any suggestions of uh, where we can get some recipes since the summer's coming, and there's going to be so many fresh veggies to yeah. to introduce him to that I have, and and to just make simple dinners. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we get home it's five, and by the time we get everything, you know, we don't want to be eating until seven. Sure, sure. Do you have any suggestions or where kind I can quick ones? Some um, quick ones or just <clears throat> well. I have a lot of recipes on my website, and a lot of them are, you know, what I say, like kid friendly in terms of just techniques and things. Um, what I, what I also try to pre um, present, <clears throat> I send out a weekly newsletter on Wednesdays, um, and try to just get people familiar with different techniques or ways of kind of working off of recipes. So the kind of best thing for you is probably just to get familiar with certain kind of techniques that you really love that you can kind of freestyle with what you have. You can save a lot of time that way so you don't have to feel um, beholden to a whole recipe. That said, um, there are a lot of great resources out there. I'm trying to think of I, there's other ones that are anything that's kind of jumping out for you guys. I look online a lot. For a quick, um, one of the it was my teacher in grad school. Her name is Cynthia Lair, and she wrote a book called Feeding the Whole Family. And I refer a lot of my patients to that book because it is there. It's all whole foods based. You know, just real food, simple food. The recipes are usually not very complicated, and there's a lot of foods in there. She gives a lot of tips for feeding. You know, younger children, even from babies, from just what you're cooking pull aside this for babies or this for older children. There's a lot of jobs in there for kids as well. And I think a lot of her recipes are pretty, I mean, I cook from it all the time and they're pretty straightforward and not time consuming. I would say too, having certain things on hand, you know, if you have a time on the weekend that you can cook a pot of beans or a pot of grains and certain things that can be prepped early, like mm -hmm. greens you can, make can like a, be prepped early. Yeah, like a big batch of something like this so that you can focus on preparing your protein um, and then you have some of your vegetable components ready. Yeah. And then if you minimize like surface area, it can help speed up um, uh, cook time, meaning like if you pound out a breast of chicken, then it's going to cook quicker um, than if you, you know, roast a chicken bone in or something like that. So you can, can kind of play with some protein, things like that. Okay, so the question is um, regarding an 11-year-old who is picky to a degree, doesn't really like to eat everything that the family's eating, and it, the older child, who's now 14, used to have these traits but has sort of grown or expanded what she's willing to eat now. So is it too late? Is 11 too late? Well, I don't think so. I don't think it's too late. You know, I think that kids are t naturally going to refuse a lot of things, and, and I don't know what... The history is with your family, if if she has always uh, been able to sort of eat something different, you know, if, if that's allowed, is she allowed to just go and fix something or not eat anything and have a bowl of cereal later? You know, I don't know what's going on there, but I would say that involving her in the meal planning, you know, she's a little older now, she can actually think about what she would like to have. And maybe one night a week, she gets to dictate what dinner is. You know, maybe she can do the shopping or, you know, negotiate at least having certain types of, you know, certain vegetables that she likes or certain proteins that she likes. I, I don't think it's too late. I, I think that kids do grow. I mean, I know I hated tomatoes forever and, you know, now I eat tomatoes all the time, but I think I was a little older, but I don't think it's too late. And I would say too, you've been through this before. So you're doing something right, right? You're older. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, we, if I make a meal, I'm wondering, should I say, you need to try, at least try it. Just mm -hmm. just try it. I mean, do you think that's too much? Because I, I think some, sometimes she's, she looks at it, she's so visual. She looks at it, she's like, eh, this is, does not look like anything I'm going to want to eat. And then she blows it off. But I think if you just tried it, you might like it, mm -hmm. or maybe not, but at least try it. 
Well, it's tough. I think you have to respect her her wishes and maybe try to dig a little deeper and see what it is that she doesn't like about it. You know, is it the smell or is she really sensitive to textures or to strong flavors? You know, is she is is she just she does she have sensory issues in general? You know, likes things a certain way, and so there may be ways for you to kind of manipulate. Cook still cook one meal, but maybe it's that she doesn't like those sauces. You know, or those those. I know people who hate you know they hate vinegar and they don't want to eat anything acidic, um, or maybe it's just a sauce issue or a spice issue. But maybe there's a way to still include her in the meal, but that allows her to to have that personal preference. I mean, you could certainly encourage her to taste it, but. It sounds like that hasn't been working for you. <laughs> I think the idea of um, involving her maybe once a week is like a way of kind of put put like helping you put a dinner together might really start to um, have her um, gain a sense of gratitude for what food like how food is made and put on the table. Even if it's really subtly, that may not be like the first thing, but she may ultimately have like either one, a sense of accomplishment that she made something that she likes and it can be super plain and simple, but it's offered and you guys are all eating it. <clears throat> and then also it can be through the process of getting involved that maybe she starts to open up a little bit more and then um, maybe um, will take a bite of something that you made because there's one, a little bonding and then also she's part of the process. Sorry, it's a quick one. Um, do you have any books that you would recommend or uh, cookbooks that you'd recommend for like a mother, daughter, father, daughter, or something, something that's not super adult but a kid could follow it besides like the strawberry shortcake ones that mm -hmm. we ha have in our house? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I'm working on a cookbook. I was going to say, can I, can I write <laughs> that book? <laughs> so there's a lot of recipes on the site, but cookbook in progress. Um, I would, yeah, I don't know in terms of like mother, daughter ones, the kind of like family, the feeding the whole family definitely sounds like that's one. Yeah. I think, I think that one feeding the whole family, I think would be amenable to that, especially in the ages that you mention. If, um, I found that some of the early ones, I started getting interested in cooking early on, like 14 kind of age. I got excited a lot about like baking, kind of all the non-healthy stuff and then kind of segued in. But the intermediary stuff too was there were like some Asian cookbooks that I thought were fun. So noodle dishes and kind of, you're including some fresh ingredients, but maybe the flavors are a little more um, um, familiar. It, you know, if she likes stuff, stuff like that. And uh, Nina, um, I think it's Nina Simons, has written um, a few Asian cookbooks that I like, A Spoonful of Ginger. There's one all about Asian noodles. So maybe something like that. I don't know. Make it kind of fun. You know, and find out what they like. If there's a certain type of food that they like, maybe you can go and look and look through some of the cookbooks at the bookstore, you know, because maybe it is soups. You know, maybe you know soups are one thing or she loves Italian food. And so maybe finding a pretty... So you flip through it and see some of the recipes that look doable for you or tackle or tackle them. I maybe wouldn't go like Jacques Pepin or something, but, <laughs> um, but it might be a project or something to work on. But especially if you can key into something that she's specifically interested in doing, it might be a way to get in there a little.